Welcome to the We Watch This Movie Podcast, where we sit down and dissect the latest and greatest in movies. I'm Dan, a.k.a. The Nolan Connoisseur, joined by the man with over 2,100 films on his watch list, Jackson Marshall on film. How you go, mate? I'd be much better if you'd correctly announce that we're now over 2,200 movies in the watch list. Despite the fact we've already clocked off about four this week, it still continues to grow. But look... Really, I couldn't be better. Why is it still growing, Jackson? You need to start narrowing it down and get it down under the 2,000. Come on. I have faith in you. Rather than watching movies, I just seem to be researching them more and more. I watch one movie, I go, oh, what's that actor in? What's that director done? And then sure enough, there's another go down the rabbit hole. movies there on the, on the watch list. That's it, mate. Go down the, dra- the Jack rabbit hole, as it were. Very pertinent to today's episode. Yes, today we're taking a look at The Hunt, the 2020 film, satirical horror, I guess you could call it, horror thriller film. We'll dive into that, and then obviously last episode, we challenged each other to watch one film each. You asked me to watch The Bad Lieutenant um, with Nicolas Cage. What was the full title? Bad Lieutenant, New Orleans. Bad and Lieutenant, Port of Call, New Orleans. How dare you speak ill of Werner Herzog and Nicolas Cage? <laughs> And I tasked you with watching The Invitation, the very mysterious thriller film. So we'll talk about that after we review The Hunt. Jackson, are you ready to go? As ready as I'll ever be. Certainly more ready than the dozen or so people that woke up in this clearing. Here we go. You actually believed we were hunting human beings for sport. (laughs) But you are. Twelve strangers wake up in a clearing. They don't know where they are or how they got there. They don't know they've been chosen for a very specific purpose. (laughs) The hunt. (laughs) I I, I guess so. Look, we can't go into the plot any more than that or we really start ruining the whole thing. But I I guess it's Battle (laughs) Royale. It's The Hunger Games. It's any human hunting movie, really. You ever seen Jean-Claude Van Damme in Hard Target, the John Woo film? Who hasn't? Right. No, I haven't actually. I haven't seen it. <laughs> I haven't seen it. Oh, what, what about Predators? Did you see that? Yeah, the one yeah. With Adrian Brody, pretty yeah. average, but I guess it's kind of the same thing, right? What was he thinking there? I don't know. What has he done le- lately? Adrian Brody, Jesus, I haven't I, seen I, him I, in anything. I think he and Ray Fiennes are just starring in more Wes Anderson features, but certainly can't complain about it. No. So the hunt. What do you think, Jackson? Initial thoughts. I could see why this is such a polarizing film. Very mixed emotions. On one hand, I love some of the performances and some parts of the writing. And then on the other hand, I hate quite a lot of it. The film wants to play really fast and loose with who it's trying to attack and what it's trying to say. It doesn't really want to pick one side and it sometimes works, sometimes doesn't. It's going to make for some really inter- interesting discussion between the two of us here today, and I, I encourage anyone who might be interested in the premise to go out and see it, but I can't quite recommend this on the whole to everybody. What are your thoughts, having just watched you it? Think it? You do think it will be controversial, has been that... Because I don't, I don't see why it's that controversial. Well, it's already proven to be controversial prior to release. In fact, this movie was actually delayed. Um, it was There was talks of Universal cancelling it altogether. It was meant to come out last year in September, October. Um, but I thought that Blumhouse was due to the, and, to and the mass shootings. Correct. That's right. Yes, there were some mass shootings over in the US, I believe, in El Paso and Dayton, just another two mass shootings for them to add up. And uh, after trailers released around uh, around the time of those mass shootings, and then even uh, even President Trump had some things to say about the movie. It was all he uh, did too. What did he a say? On, right? He sent a tweet out, did he? Yeah, he made some very interesting tweets, kind of attacking some of the filmmakers um, and attacking the film as well. I mean, right. the guy's just absolute gold to read his tweets. I mean, that's and any, and any of his social media. So there's no surprise that is he decided to attack them here. It's funny though because. This movie is very politically in line with what he thinks. <laughs> it is, isn't it? Well, that's pretty good marketing if you can get him involved, isn't it? I mean, it's uh, any marketing is good marketing. I don't know how well yeah, this did point. in the box box office because it came out earlier this year, I believe, and just before COVID sort of struck, didn't it? Well, this landed when COVID struck. In fact, I did a deep dive into some of the box office numbers and 
this this uh, total gross, its total worldwide box office gross was really its opening weekend. It was projected to do maybe 10 or 11 million in its opening weekend on a budget of 14. One of the bigger budget movies from Blumhouse and it really fell short of that. It only pulled in about 5 million and sure enough, come the second week in release, it was gone. Theatres were shut. I know here oh, in Australia, no. I was interested yeah. in seeing it and I don't even think it got to an opening weekend here. No, nah, it didn't. In fact, anything anything that was out this the this latest weekend, I believe it was early or maybe mid March, in um here in Australia and worldwide. Everything since then has just sunk. Bloodshot was one of those movies hit. The Hunt, Fantasy Island, another Blumhouse feature that that bombed not just financially but critically. That really took a hit. You know that weekend since the before cinemas cinemas were closed due to COVID. That was the worst weekend for box office globally on record since October 1998, where <laughs> everything only took Jesus. in about 55 million. Listen yeah. to listen to this stellar lineup of movies from October 1998. So number one in their top 10. Practical Magic. You ever heard of that? <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Number two. Here's, an, here's another masterpiece. Number two, Bride of Chucky. Oh, no. Number three, Ants. Not a bad movie. Oh, I like that. That was good. Number four, Rush Hour. Oh, come on. What's I going that, on? <laughs> that might have been playing that have been playing in cinemas for five weeks by this point. Okay. Some other ones here that, that stand out. We're not going to go through the whole list, but uh, At Night at the Roxbury. Truly underrated, probably one of the, the the more okay SNL films. Ronan and there's something about Mary. Many of these movies wow. have been out for a month or so at this point. So October 1998, not a not a high point and for. And what uh, came out? Uh, what was coming out here was was it Birds of Prey, Bloodshot, and Fantasy Island, The Hunt. What was the big uh, star remember, of that? Remember we saw the way back and we saw a trailer for a Christian romance musical film. I still believe. Yeah, you remember that? Yeah, I yeah, do. I do. So that one, that one landed the same time as COVID as well. So oh, I guess I guess we missed out on a real ripper there. <laughs> well, Invisible Man landed around the same time as well, and that that ended up doing all right, didn't it? That that did. Invisible Man had been out worldwide, I believe, in February, so it had okay. it had a, a massive leg up on these other films we've mentioned. Well, you know, Bloomhouse aren't known for their fantastic films, so when I saw that. Uh, animation come up at the top of the movie I was a little bit concerned and especially when they're known for putting some of their worst films in January some of their horrors that they don't think are going to do great because January is typically a time where it's sort of a dead zone where everyone's just put out their big blockbuster films over Christmas and yeah, January is always known for less income, I believe, in, in cinemas. So they usually try... The, the best and... way to sum up January, I, this is one directly from Red Letter Media. So don't at me if you think if you think I'm making... If you, if you think I'm trying to claim I made this up, I certainly didn't. But that'd be, fuck you, it's January. <laughs> yeah, so it's, it's sort of where they just throw their worst movies. I feel like they throw their worst movies in and see 100%. how they do. So many um, terrible horrors. Poor, yeah, we had the grudge, Benny I Gilman. remember. Came yeah, out Betty, in January. Remember Betty Gilpin was in the Grudge. Yeah, she look. Let's let's get into my thoughts. Um, let's go. Let's actually get into the hunt here. Yeah, I haven't actually <laughs> even said anything. I um, I got mixed feelings as well on this film. Some parts entertaining, and some parts were just plain stupid for me. <laughs> um, but sometimes the stupidity of it, you know, created some laughs for me. And it, it's one of those films where you sort of. Can't help be, but be a little bit charmed by some of the dumb humour. Me personally, anyway. I, some of this dumb humour just gets me every time. I think of the vacation. I think of vacation. I think of Grimsby. Those two recently, those um, comedies, if you haven't watched them, and you like this sort of dumb humour, those two are hilarious. And you, know, you just can't take them seriously. But I don't really get the controversy around this. I understand the political sort of themes... Tr- weaving in i guess but i it was it wasn't taking any sides i don't i don't feel like it was and i mean without betty gilpin in this who's from glow which i watched the first season of she was oh you've seen well. glow yeah, I wanted to talk yeah. about that i haven't watched it yet yeah it's a it's a decent show not a great show i i didn't mind it her and uh allison brie um she she was the she carried this film i thought um, oh, hundred percent. It was it was hers to carry, and I'm I'm there with you, mate. I believe she knocked it out of the park. But it's without bis- without without her, I, I wouldn't have liked this. No, it was bizarre. Though. I thought Emma Roberts was going to be the lead, seeing her in the opening, and 
about 30 minutes in, I'm thinking, where the hell is Emma Roberts? I haven't seen her. And I, re- I, I realized that she'd been shot earlier on. I must have missed it. Blink of an eye, she was gone. <laughs> it really, it really up. is blink, blink and you miss it. I um I was eating dinner last night when I actually sat down to watch this movie. And sure enough, I looked down at my bowl to get the next mouthful, looked up, and there was a, a blood squib. She was gone. <laughs> yeah. And it was the same for some of the other notable actors or notable in quotations there was some <laughs> you know there were some decent actors i guess in there um that especially that for got a blumhouse picture a, i guess we're spoiling it now jackson should we go straight into spoilers for anyone that hasn't watched the film uh, look i'd say check it out uh, maybe if you're bored it's not one that you should be racing to see um it has some some strong points but by the end you, you're wanting it to end for me anyway. What, what did you think, Jackson? Give the restrictions, especially here in Australia for our, our listeners uh, down under, give the restrictions a few a few more weeks to relax and, and ease up so you can get a few friends around to, to watch this because it'll make for some interesting conversation. Plus, right now on streaming with a $20 price tag, and I want to talk about that a little bit later, it might be a little hard to justify, but you, you could certainly do a whole lot worse. So maybe it's just maybe just something a bit lighthearted with a couple of drinks. Yeah, sure, but don't expect anything too deep or, or profound. With that, we haven't got too much else we can discuss without spoilers, so you said it, Dan. Let's get right into it. Spoiler alert. Did you, did, were you entertained through this, Jackson? Uh, or were you entertained in parts like me? You know, some parts hit, other parts fell extremely flat. How, where did you sit? It's, it's kind of throwing everything at the wall and yeah, I'm right there with you, Dan. At, su- at some points I was I was laughing. Some points were a little cringeworthy, mm, but cringe the, notable, is the, word. the notable cast, I enjoyed seeing some familiar faces in there. Glenn Howerton, who's, um, who's doing some great work at the moment on a few TV shows and of course is well known for It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia. Mm-hmm. I was excited to see him in some of the first couple scenes when he popped back up. He's always a joy to watch. He really is just his character, Dennis kind of turned up even more menacing if you can believe it um it's always sunny fans out there know what i'm talking about and ike barinholtz who's been appearing in more uh pitches in the last five years he was he was all right he was he's, what alive for the first 20 30 minutes he was pretty fun he's really coming up isn't he you could think you're yeah, going to see him he, in a lot more correct he's been, he was fairly underrated there for a little while he's very interesting looking actor. He's um, it's really hard he's, to say he's got leading man material he's clearly talented but he's, he's not, not pre- leading man material but he, you could throw him in anything as comedy relief, I feel. I think he's got a real future ahead of him in terms of comedy. But And, he, and his face is very recognisable as well. He's sort of always going to be that stereotype, uh, goofy character, though. I don't think you can get him out of that. I think it'd be Maybe. tough to get him in a dramatic role, being serious. <laughs> Yeah, but if um, he, he's he's got a great sense for comic timing, and I can see him as he get as he's getting older, kind of becoming one of those older character actors, someone that could really rock it in a thriller when he's he's looking a bit more weathered. He might be carrying some baggage. I think right now he might even still be a bit too young for that. The thing is, going back to the the comedy actors transitioning, I'm going on a loop here, but the only go for it. The only person that's really done it well recently, I believe, is Steve Carell. Back in 2015, he he did a movie called Foxcatcher, which was completely oh, I've still got to watch it. Completely different character from what he'd ever done before. Extremely serious makeup on, and although though the film was slow, I really enjoyed it. And his performance was a stand. I believe he was nominated for an Oscar, and among other things, because it was just incredible what he was able to do. And for this guy, Ike uh, Baron Holtz. I think he's got a long way to go until he gets to that sort of uh, stage. So I think we will see him in a lot of comedies moving forward. And we saw him in Blockers, which was quite funny. Did you watch kudos Blockers? For get, kudos for getting his name right there, Dan. Did I? Ike Baron Holt? Yeah, mate. You nailed it on the head. Steve <laughs> what Carell is that? in, in what, the big shot. That, f- that was what? another good dramatic turn from him, wasn't it? It was. What's Baron Holt? What, what nationality is that? Sounds Polish. Polish, you reckon? Yeah, we saw him in Blockers. He was quite funny in that. I wouldn't say he was the leading man, but he was one of a few of the leading cast. He did an okay job there. And then we saw him in Suicide Squad, wasn't it? A, a smaller role there. Yeah, less said about that movie, the better. That'll make for its own episode one day. Oh, that's Maybe a, when that's we a get masterpiece, that, that, isn't it? That sequel by James Gunn coming out. Would you Would you agree with me that Suicide Squad's a masterpiece? 10 out of 10? 
Ah, uh, only kidding. Yeah, so there was some notable actors in The Hunt, but it was definitely led by our leading lady here, Betty Gilpin, who was very tight-lipped, um, very sort of dull in the performance in some ways, but it, it worked, didn't it? Really? I thought she had this great talent for contorting her face and scowling. Yeah, it was no, like, that's it, what It was a bit like I mean. a mix between Bruce Campbell as Ash in The Evil Dead and kind of like a female Clint Eastwood. She was brooding, yeah, yeah. but she just had this real self-awareness and kind of knew that the whole thing was a bit of a piss take. She did. I was going to say the same thing. It came across like that, which was and good. It, and it, it worked. It was the right kind of tone for this film and especially for her character. Someone else who might not have, have, have had that same understanding and really wanted to go as all in into the picture, it definitely wouldn't have worked. We needed her when she popped up about 20 minutes in, that's for sure. That's why I'm so happy she was the lead and not Emma Roberts because I didn't want, I did not want to see Emma Roberts lead this film. No way. I have to <laughs> that would have been a stinker, man, really. <laughs> um, what, who I was surprised to see, uh, Hilary Swank. Yes, I couldn't Although, place her. I, 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 could, I, I couldn't think of her name. Where has she been? Well, she was in Million Dollar Baby. She was in Boys Don't Cry. She's been in a lot of great films. And maybe this is the best she can get these days. I'm not sure. I haven't seen much of her work recently. She's known for being quite picky, I believe, in in Hollywood. So so she picked this? That's the thing. It, it's bizarre, isn't it? She was only in the last, what, 20, 30 minutes of the film and was sort of the main villain, you could call her. But I thought all the villains in this sort of fell flat especially in that middle section and it was just very goofy i guess it's it was the theme of the film but i don't know mate it was just a bit something was off about it and that final scene where the two are having a battle of wits and the action set i wasn't all that invested and it went on a little bit long for me the whole back and forth of are you the real crystal or not i think it was a little bit on the nose as well what do you think of that what do you mean it was a bit on the nose? It was sort of a play on Twitter and, and how we're always, you know, um, jumping to conclusions. I guess it was yep. a little bit on the nose in that in that form, especially the whole movie is a, bit, a little bit about how we're jumping to conclusions on things. Yeah, for me, that satirical take and what the movie is trying to say, um, particularly about free speech and those voicing their mind on the internet it's certainly not a strong point it doesn't have it doesn't quite take a clear no. stance and want, and wants to communicate a clear message i do enjoy some of the ambiguity about um betty gilpin's character crystal or snowball when we're talking about the animal farm references um part of her backstory that it's unclear if she really is this real crystal cl- uh, crazy or if she's really just someone else so yeah, it's 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 tough. I, if that is the point of the film, then that doesn't quite work. Um, but I, I, I like some of the other casting. Ethan Suppley as the internet podcaster um, is an interesting take. I do quite like that. It, it, and well, we some, of the, some, with, of the, um, some of the actors who play the hunters, mm, yeah, it's yeah. kind of meant to be goofy. We're not meant to take it seriously whatsoever. It, there's not a whole lot of um, a whole lot of tension there. Uh, with with um, even we we saw it explored with Don the Don character. Where oh, yeah, of he course. sort of gets I thought that he, was quite effective. He turns on her, but then later on we, we find out, well, was he actually turning on her at all? Or was was it just once again that theme of believing things too early and Yeah, a lot, a lot about facades and taking things at face value, I suppose. Um that sequence with Don was certainly a standout with me when they've um when it's Don and um and Crystal standing in front of the radio. I, I enjoyed that. I thought that was clever. I also thought that the older couple in the gas station, that was really a, a clever that turn. Was probably, yeah, that was probably the best 10 minutes of the film, nearly, for me. Yeah, probably that first 20 minutes when we go from the gas station and we learn that the gas station's not all it's cracked up to be, and then we find out we're in Croatia. My jaw was pretty much on the floor. That was really <laughs> effective. What did you think? Yeah, no, I like the older couple, the turn there. Um, that was one of the most entertaining parts for me, that that uh, that section there with the older couple turning and there were some references there to black people and hicks and all sorts of things. Them not being in, what was the state, Mississippi? Uh, Arkansas. Them being Arkansas, them actually being Croatia. That whole storyline, I, I can't say it was doing anything for me, really. Really? I just like the back and forth. Like, I was like, where are we going? I just like the what? back and forth with the old lady and the characters just sort of bantering and them trying to figure out a way to kill them. That that sort of stuff was good, but 
yeah, you certainly don't want to go through the, the plot with a fine tooth comb. God only knows what kind of holes he you'll pick up. <laughs> I know. I know. The, the tone the, the tone does hold it together for the most part. If it was played if it was played well, seriously and not so much for laughs, then we might be in trouble. Which oh, could be, yeah, we'd which, be in trouble, all right. Jesus Christ. Yes, you know, especially when we get the, the poor woman who ends up falling on the spikes, like Barinholtz pulls her out and then she gets Oh, mate, up. that's got to be the funniest part that for was, me. <laughs> Come on. Exactly. That was hilarious. That, that was when I... That set the tone, didn't it? She falls into the spikes. They pull her out. He pulls her out and... She's almost unfazed. She's just been impaled by about six spikes. She's just walking sort of a bit. Oh, hurt, yeah, but... she was just walking. <laughs> <laughs> and that's that sort of set the tone. And then she falls back in again. And then what what does she do? She says she shoots herself. Wait, when and she says, when she ends up falling back in, um in fact I think it's one character who actually dies after saving her. Then Ike Barinholtz comes in <laughs> to grab her and she says, No, 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 don't pull me out, don't pull me out. She ends up grabbing a gun off him and then just shoots herself in the head. Calls him a punce or something for not doing it. Herself. <laughs> it's just ridiculous. That That's the stuff so I laughed out loud. There was a couple of other moments as well like that that were quite funny. But it's when they get into the whole political side, which where they where they lose me. Um, So did you know much about Craig Sobel, the director of this? I had not seen any of his work looking at his IMDb. Before we recorded here, I could not put my finger on any of these films without I'd seen any of them. I, I noticed there was one with Margot Robbie. Yes, Z for Zachariah. I had heard of that picture. Margot Robbie, um, uh, Chris Pine, and who's the other actor's name that was in 12 Years a Slave? Do you want to give that a go at pronouncing? Here we go. Drum roll, please. Here we go. Chiwetel. <laughs> I will tell as you fall. The jokes just write themselves. They do, don't they? Um, that looks like an interesting. I picture. just absolutely butchered his name, but he is a great actor. Great. <laughs> <laughs> that's 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 all definitely staying in. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> no, 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 I'm gonna go again. Wait, wait one second. I want to hear. I want to hear. How you actually pronounce his name. How Bear to pronounce. Me. Isn't it Here like Chatel Algefor? Chiwetel Ajiofor. Chiwetel Ajiofor. Apparently. Chiwetel Ajiofor. Chiwetel Ajiofor. Chiwetel Ajiofor. Cool. Um, so, Dan, I guess you were. Yeah, so Z for I, I Zachariah. Guess we're pretty, pretty far off, should do well, Algefor. Look, Z, <laughs> Z, Z for Zachariah was on my watch list. Have you seen it? No. No, but it's on mine, which is now over 2,230. <laughs> I had looked at some of the director's previous work, but I was far more interested in not only our producers, of course, Jason Blum of Blumhouse Productions fame, in case you didn't know, but Damon Lindelof. Dan, can you give us some insight into Damon Lindelof? You, you don't even know who he is by name. Of course I do. The Lost series, my favourite TV series of all time. Okay, I won't go that far. But it used to be up high. And he, he did The Leftovers, did he? And he did, and he was the showrunner Ro- for Watchmen. Oh, yes, of course. Now, I'm going to pose this question to you. If Damon Lindelof's name was not attached to this project, would it have been made? Eh. <laughs> Is my answer <laughs> <laughs> pretty pretty much? This is um there were, had been a different cast uh, recently uh, originally attached to this film, which included uh, Jonathan Galecki, who you might remember. Um, and I, I just I, when I consider it, it's a bit like hmm, I wonder if this had have happened. But Damon Lindelof has done some quite popular stuff, and his co-writer Nick Coys um, had also penned some work on Watchmen as well as Maniac on Netflix. Did you ever catch Maniac? One okay. directed by, is it Carrie Joy Fujina- Fujinaga? Oh, which yeah, is, he's yeah. He's giving us the new Bond. Yeah. yeah. And it stars um, it stars Joni Hill and 
Emma Stone. Oh, I remember watching the first four I episodes. And I've, I've got now to give that I, one another watch. I gave it. The f- I watched the first episode and tuned out. I wasn't a big fan of that first episode. I guess you're from excited memory. for that Bond movie then. It was very bizarre. I remember. It was very, very unique. I, I don't quite remember it to be fair, but I remember. I, just, remember, I, remember, I don't remember or, anything. I remember um, Justin Thoreau looking like he just stepped off. He just come off the set of another David Lynch film. <laughs> <laughs> I knew you were gonna. I knew you were gonna say that. <laughs> any, any excuse, mate? As soon as you said his name. Lynch. Yeah. So talking about the prestige of Nolan. Um, oh, sorry. Uh, <laughs> what were we talking about? The Hunt. Yeah, The Hunt. Um, good film. All right. No. Um, look, what did you think of the controversy of this film, though? I mean, I don't see where this controversy sort of came from. Besides what you said earlier. I don't. I don't think they had much to say, really. In it's this hard. It, it's hard for us here in Australia. Um, as much as we yeah. hear about a lot of the news going on in the US, we just aren't exposed to a lot of the the politics and and um and some more libertarians think and the lib and the Liberal Party and just things like that. It doesn't res- resonate as as um yeah. as heavily with us. It's certainly an aggressive movie at times and very cynical. I said earlier that it doesn't that it kind of wants to attack everyone, so I guess that that could be quite controversial. But it's not the biggest bombshell of a flick that's ever come out. Would you Would you call it a black comedy? Yes, absolutely. This yeah. could be a this could be a dark comic action thriller. We've got just as many genres thrown in here as we do in something like Parasite. I don't know if we could quite compare the two. <laughs> well, no. Well, the original title for this was Red State versus Blue State. Well, that tells you something, doesn't it? Well, the different um, sort of political environments in the U.S. You, you obviously know. So, and obviously. when I when I saw that, now it sort of makes a bit more sense, you know, with the Hicks and all that sort of stuff referenced. Um, but again, it it doesn't really say much. There's not really much controversy there. I don't feel like what do they what are they actually trying to put across here? Correct. They don't hone in on a on a certain area. Mm. The closest they come to would be honing in on Animal Farm. We've got The Pig, which is released alongside The Case of Weapons, named Orwell Mm. after George Orwell, of course, who wrote Animal Farm 1984 and whichever other literary masterpiece you want to bring up. Um, Mm -hmm. And Crystal Betty Gilpin's character also goes by the name Snowball, is given to her from Hilary Swank's Athena and her um, murderous cohorts. Plus they, um, they name some of the other characters as animals from the book. And the book is about is, is a allegorical about the rise of communism and the Russian revolution in the 1917 and all about we're give, we're going to dish out freedom to people and let, and, and, you know, it's going to be, um, this will be a democracy and it, it's back to the people, everything given to the people. And what do they make of it? They make of it a dictatorship. And I guess that has something to say on this movie where these, where, if I want to seek vengeance against those that I feel have wronged me or have said or have said the wrong thing about me, then I should be allowed to do it however I see fit, even if that means murdering them in a manner of state um, in Vermont or in Croatia, like in this movie. In fact, there's that interesting tale that Betty Galpin uh, speaks at one point about the jackrabbit and the tortoise. Do you remember that one? Yeah, that was a bit bizarre, wasn't it? Oh, I didn't get, sort of get the meaning behind that. Do you have more insights? I do, yeah. I managed to dig up an interview here with um, with Cinema Blend from both the director Craig Zobel and Betty Gilpin. That was really weird. It sort of went on and on that story, and I it was just it was a bit left to field, wasn't it? I didn't get if it was a joke. Like, correct, yeah. Forgive me. It actually wasn't the director. It was writer Damon Lindelof, your favorite from Lost. So here's here's them commenting on that um, Jack Rabbit and Hare story, not the tortoise and sorry, on the <laughs> Jack Rabbit and tortoise story. <laughs> God, this this has just been a stellar episode so far. So (laughs) here's what they have to say. In the real world, that person, referring to the jackrabbit or the hare, if they lost, there would be vengeance. And so I'm always curious what happens after the fable. So if anything, that scene illustrates what happens when you try wag your finger at someone and try to teach them a lesson. Your finger might find itself getting bitten off. And I guess that's Crystal Creasy. That's better gilping in this movie. She mm-hmm. immediately understands the kind of situation she's in. We find out she has a military background and she's going to take it back to these people. If they think they hey, can fuck with her, well, they've got another thing coming. At least they filled that plot hole because for the first, I want to say, 45 minutes, she's doing all these fancy action moves and wielding these guns and all sorts of things. <laughs> we had no idea. My brain had well and truly so- turned off by that point, so I was just happy <laughs> to see some action. Yeah, what did you think of the action, particularly that last ending ending part? 
Is this a female John Wick? Not quite. <laughs> oh, Jesus. It almost works. Don't even I'd... put John Wick in this. Would I, would I watch a, Would I watch a, an action film with Betty Gilpin? Absolutely. Yes, is this, that's is what this I the came movie out I'd of watch? this with. Not quite, but she does her best given the pretty weak screenplay. If you put her against John Wick, I, that would be believable after seeing her in this. Yeah, fucking know. John reckon? Wick 4, get Betty Gilpin in she's there. She's awesome. 100%. She's, she's really good. She should she should be in a Wonder Woman film as a villain yes. or something like that. Yeah. Absolutely. I have it here in my notes. Why what superhero is, film would you cast her in? Kristen Wiig, Kirsten Wiig, whatever, however you say it. Another why one is she in. Cheetah in Wonder Woman? Let's get Betty in. Come on. Yeah, but who the fuck is Cheetah? <laughs> it's the main villain of Wonder, uh, Wonder Woman. Come on. Spoilers! <laughs> Movie's been delayed and you've gone ahead and done this. Thank you very much. Sorry, All guys. Right, it's been another great podcast, everyone. I've had enough. Uh, no, yes. If, if anything I get from this movie is I'll be what, taking a closer look at her and what she's in. Um, yes. That I, sounded I, a bit weird, I'm, but... I'm, <laughs> I, really, I really want to watch Glow now. What do you reckon? I think it? you'd really like Glow. I think you'd really like Glow. We, it didn't we resonate both, we both much. A, we both have a passing interest in wrestling. Yeah, I mean, mine mine has dwindled over the years, but that 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 wasn't the reason I watched it. It was just sort of you know what Netflix is like. They just drag you in sometimes, you know, especially with their new features of what's really been getting me is number one film in Australia, or you know, you know how they're doing the top tens now. That's yeah, really is, um, is that why you wanted to watch Extraction? Um. Look, that and Crims, Chris Hems, Crimson, Crimson Hemsworth, Hemsworth. <laughs> Crimson Hemsworth. <laughs> oh shit! I mean, how much more can we go off track from reviewing this film? Um. Yeah, the action set, the action set pieces for me in this were very, very average, and I and I would say the same for the cinematography, the music. The production design, everything was very B grade, very typical Bloomhouse. Unfortunately, didn't have any gravios to it. Any you can't expect any a, whole, sort of flair, a whole lot from them, especially on a fourteen million dollar budget. They're writing off Blumhouse the coattails here of the script and the somewhat controversy and trying to get people in through that, and then obviously the Hunger Games uh, battle royale theme that's very popular at the moment, but. Did not resonate with me, unfortunately. Jackson, let's go into our favourite scene, if you do have one. Yeah, for sure. We touched on it earlier, and I love the sequence from when Betty heads to the gas station. She jumps on the train. We have the crisis actors alongside Ethan Supley's uh, podcaster, Gary. And then all of a sudden, we're in Croatia. Like, how we got there, I was just thinking, what kind of film are we watching? I was really excited to see where it was going to go. And did it pay off? Mm, almost. It was cool to see Holy Swank later on. But yeah, that 10, 15 minutes was very, very interesting. It, it, we weren't sure what was going to happen. Are we going to get killed by these military? Are they in on it? Were they ever? Who knows? Yeah, I totally agree. That You've just stolen mine again. I mean, why do we always have the favorite, same favorite scene? Are we that much on sync? Well, come on, mate. <clears throat> For the sake of entertainment, give us something else. So for me, my favorite scene, Jackson, is going to be a quite a simple one. As I said before, I didn't want to see Emma Roberts lead this uh, film. So when her head was splattered into a million pieces, that would have to be my favorite scene. Even <laughs> despite the terrible CGI? Well, the CGI was terrible, but it was. I feel like that was one stylistic choice, I guess. What do you think? I don't know, because it was very... On, very um, Average. Very clumsy. Very clumsy. <laughs> it, it was like watermelons exploding. Uh, I like oh, it. If, if, we ha- if we actually had a real watermelon exploding, that would have been the cherry on the cake. <laughs> yeah. Um, any more behind the scenes, Jackson, before we head into our final ratings for The Hunt? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I've got so much to talk about. All right, Jackson. So I think we've covered everything for The <laughs> Hunt that we can. <laughs> <laughs> this has been a tough one for us to go through today for whatever reason it, it, it's just a hard film to recommend and also review it's such an american movie before you go into your ratings yeah. this is very much an american movie 
And sure, it's a bit of cheeky fun. It's a little bit of a guilty pleasure. Would I re- rewatch it? Probably not right now. Certainly not three more times for $1,000, like you mentioned with Bloodshot. <laughs> we always go back to that Bloodshot review. If you haven't listened to it, give it a good listen. Please, we, anything, let's, please. Well, let's just say they haven't listened to it. It's the, it's the worst performing review. Let's just put it out there. <laughs> well, if, um, they haven't, if they haven't listened to it, they've probably heard it enough by now that they certainly don't need to. <laughs> All right, come on. Right, right if back you want to it, hear us pop- rag on Bloodshot, for an hour, episode three, was it? Episode two. Episode two. All right, come yeah. on. This is a lot of padding. Let's go into the final rating here. All right. So final rating for me is going to be a six out of 10. Um, All right. Yeah, I'll go one higher than I thought. I, I, originally, I had it at a five. I'm going to go six. I was I was entertained. It wasn't long enough to overstay its welcome. It had some comedy in there. I didn't take it too seriously. So for me, um, I enjoyed bits and pieces of it. Obviously, it fell flat in a lot of areas as well, but I, I probably couldn't recommend it at a six uh, to most people. But if you want to see a, another decent comedy, maybe, I mean, this might be for you and, and just sit back and enjoy it with some mates, as you said, and have a few beers. I think that way, <clears throat> it might be funnier that way. Um, but yeah, I couldn't recommend it to a mass audience. So it's going to be a six out of 10 from me. All right, he can't recommend it to a mass audience despite a positive review. So, Danny, me, see, the, the, okay, let me just clarify, call? Jackson. Six out of ten for me is average. Okay, okay, okay. Most okay. people, five out of ten is for me. I'm I'm a bit of like a game reviewer where, it, it, in the gaming world, a seven out of ten is average. <laughs> okay, so for why, me, why I come even, from why that even culture. Go up to ten then? Why not just do a seven out of seven? <laughs> I, I come to I come from that culture, so a six out of ten is average. Five out of ten is disappointing this, for this me. Is just so I've got a dip, isn't it? This goes up to eleven. I, I, I may give ten and an eleven. So <laughs> I may give ten and eleven. <laughs> who's, you who's never who's know. That? <laughs> uh, a guy you might know, uh, Christopher Nolan. Uh, anyway, <laughs> what's your rating, Jackson? Six out of 10, Dan, from you. Before I go into mine, listen to how closely your ratings align with the the mass public here. So the hunt on IMDb, from the limited release it's had, from 31,000 user ratings, 6.4 out of 10. Very close to what you gave it. Rotten Tomatoes, critics reception, very mixed, 56% from 213 reviews and an average score of 5.78 out of 10. So very closely aligned with what you had there. Audience score on Rotten Tomatoes, 66%, 3.58 out of 5. So I think cert- you find that most people give this a 6 in general yeah. general public. I think it's it just hovers around the 5 to 6 range, I think. For sure. Metacritic, 50 from 45 reviews. Again, very divisive. And finally, mm. shout out to our boys and girls who work at the amazing social media app, Letterboxd. <laughs> Well, uh, the the fact we haven't been haven't got that paycheck from them yet is really bugging me. Um, we haven't been in contact with them. Bear in mind, but uh, <laughs> we can pass our details over if they are obliged. Well, we have got some new sponsors this week, so it'll be great to have a talk about them in a little bit. But Letterboxd, why can't you be one of them too? Okay, on Letterboxd, three out of five from twenty eight thousand people having watched it. So you are right in line there, Dan, at your 6 out of 10. And guess what? The hunt for me comes in 5 out of 10, hammer-wielding jackrabbits. I thought you'd go 5. I Two points for five. Betty Gilpin, one point for Hilary Swank, one point for Glenn Howerton, and another point for some of the action. Thank you very much. The hunt, put it to rest. Hunt's over. The hunt is over. If we ever review The Hunt again, it's going to be the 2020 film, uh, the 2012 film from Mads Mikkelsen, which is a phenomenal film. Ooh, I haven't seen that. If you haven't that. seen that, give it a watch, guys. The Hunt 2012. It's a French film, so there are subtitles. Is it? Is it French? Um, is it not Danish? Sorry, it might be Danish. Oh, <laughs> God, my memory is like a goldfish, I think. This is where the, the technical <laughs> difficulties music plays. <laughs> it's, a ch- it's a garbage truck on fire. <laughs> um, <laughs> all right. The Hunt, five and a six, 5.5 collectively. So we settle at a five. five. We settle at a five for our collective review, guys. Let's take a moment to thank our sponsors for today. Our first sponsor is VPN Express. So you guys can get 
You can get three months free if you check out expressvpn.com slash we watch this. Slash we watch exclusive this. link. You exclusive guys can get link. three months free. Three months free. All you have to do is copy what I say. Wait, what do I have to do? <laughs> So what are, if you didn't know what uh, ExpressVPN is, guys, uh, you can choose. There's there's a and bunch girls. of features, but you can choose from 160 locations across 94 countries and select your VPN. Keep your real location hidden from prying eyes. But also, what I do with it, sometimes there's stuff on Netflix that I want to watch in the US. Netflix, being here in Australia, we don't get it all. So I remember The Office, I believe, was on Netflix US. So made an account on Netflix used uh, VPN Express and was able to get in there and uh, watch some of my favorite shows. So that's one way you can use it. Also, as I said, stop the prying eyes. And again, it's expressvpn.com slash we watch this for three free months on your 12-year plan, guys. Check them out. Maybe you, also, want to, maybe you want to dial in from Croatia and have a look at what's going on with Matagate. So, couldn't be a better service than expressvpn.com <laughs> slash we watch this for that. Display, they're back! Display, I still haven't received my movie posters for Jack and Jill. What's going on? Oh, we need to get them to you, actually. The Jack and Jill ones specifically, and maybe even an After Earth one. I thought I was getting movie 43. I, I, wanted, I just wanted that amazing image what of, about Hugh, cats? of Hugh Jackman with the balls on his chin. <laughs> <laughs> Where would that sit in, in your office? Probably right under the table, if you know what I mean. <clears throat> oh, Jesus. Anyway, Displate. Sorry, let's thank Displate for sponsoring the podcast. Displate are thick metal plates with gallery quality prints on them. They will easily stick to your wall. No hassle, fuss free, and look great in any room or office environment. And Dan, I'm waiting on three. Which three are you waiting on? I'm waiting on Lost Display Poster, Watchmen, and The Leftovers. <laughs> you did, definitely didn't look that up on Damon Lindelof's IMDb. So, if, if you were interested, and we really recommend it, on getting two, three, four, five, six, however many display posters. I've got a friend of mine who bought about seven of them coming up for friends' birthdays in the next year. We want you to go to display.com slash we watch this for 20% off your purchase. 20% off. Everyone's looking to save on pennies and scrape cash where they can during this trying time, but you've still got to be getting those gifts. When you're going to get them for your loved ones, display.com slash we watched this for 20% off. They support us. We support them. Thank you to our sponsors. Dan, what's up next in the pod? Jackson, so I watched Bad Lieutenant. You watched The Invitation. You watched it Bad was Lieutenant. our challenge. I it was our challenge last week. We both have our thoughts on the movies. I want you to start with The Invitation. What did you think? I thought this would be a future episode. Thoroughly enjoyed myself. Thank you very much for recommending this mm. psychological thriller slash horror slash cult film. I don't want to go too much into the plot as it's really going to spoil some of it, but... Yeah. Look, you complained about Midsommar being a slow burn. This was you think a this really was slow? Really slow burn. This yeah. was a real slow burn. But I did enjoy how it gave us just slowly, piece by piece, what we needed to know about the characters and the plot and where it might have mm. been going. It had this unsettling feeling oh, to the didn't whole it? picture. We were oh. waiting for something to pay off, something to pay off, and it, it kind of and finally did. those violin did. strings that came through as well. Did you notice that? The what, sorry? With the music? The violin strings, they're just sort yes. of eerie music. Only just, every few minutes. Uh, yeah. Look, I must say, I'll get some of the negatives out of the way. Um, I thought I felt that some of the cast could be better. I enjoyed Logan. Yeah, Logan, definitely. I enjoyed Logan Marshall Green, aka not Tom Hardy in the film. <laughs> you the said way, it, just, not me. By the way, just going back to the hunt, I thought not Luke Wilson at the very start was uh, was very interesting. <laughs> but look, not 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 Tom Hardy did a really great job. The film was anchored on him, very similar to Betty Gilpin in the hunt, and I mm. thought that for the most part he did quite well. The dialogue in this, I don't know if this was written by Karen Kasuma, who directed it. Um, in, fact, in fact, I think it was directed maybe by her husband, or, sorry, written by her husband or ex-husband. The dialogue in this was so fucking terrible. Not one person speaks like this. It's very hyper-realistic, very, <laughs> very unreal. Um, but it, it does it does work. They, they get across the points that they need to. And for 96 minutes, you could do a heck of a lot worse. I don't want to go into it too much more other than thank you for recommending this picture. For a dinner party from Hell movie, it works. So for me, it's coming in at 
Seven out of ten, spooky red lanterns. Yeah, nice. What do you think also of Michael Huseman? I think that's how you say from Game of Thrones. Yes, Houseman. from Game of Thrones. I couldn't. He, I, couldn't I thought he was either. a standout of that film as well. Eh, his performance was just okay. Logan Marshall Green, yeah. one to watch. I'm really excited to see him in Upgrade. I remember we touched on Upgrade when mm. we were talking about The Invisible Man, another picture from Lee Winnell that um, was critically lauded. Shout out to Blumhouse for giving Lee Winnell some awesome opportunities. Well, Jackson, it's funny you gave this a seven because someone over here has given a similar rating to the film you suggested for me. Oh, Bad, and what movie was that? Bad Lieutenant, The Port of New Orleans. Sure. Look, I'm calling it Bad Lieutenant. My God, Nicolas Cage. I haven't seen him film with him in a while. It was refreshing. Refreshing? Jeez, he's a crazy son of a bitch, isn't he? <laughs> Far out. <laughs> He's insane, this bloke. Without too the many stuff spoilers, he does can you in this film. Into what he was doing. Oh in this my movie? god, man! I couldn't believe what I was watching at some points. What, he's definitely a bad lieutenant. Let's just say that. <laughs> <laughs> what did, what did you think about what he uh, when he pulls the the kids off the side of the road after oh. seven hour nightclub? I think that's like what twenty minutes in. From that oh point, it's, we know what kind of movie we're in for. From that point, I knew this was a Jack and Jackson Marshall recommendation. <laughs> <laughs> Marshall on film, followed by an underscore. No, honestly, I did enjoy myself, though. Look, in the middle, I think it dragged a little. But besides that, it was a crazy ride with Nicholas at the helm. Just It, it gave me some vibes of Uncut Gems where he's just making terrible decisions. And he's such... I guess he's, he's not as likable as Adam Sandler. But he's, there is something about him. I don't everyone, know. Everyone I, has an affinity for Nicolas Cage. He is quite charming, even even when he's totally unhinged, off the total rails. We've got oh, no idea what's going to happen next. Can you, you give just me, have to watch? You can't turn away. You need to give me some more recommendations of Nick Cage, please, because I want to I want to go down this rabbit hole now that I've seen. Well, this. have you have you just started something? Because <laughs> it it was fascinating watch. Um, even it was uh, Eva Mendes popped up, uh, Exhibit popped up. Few what about Val Kilmer? Ones. Val Kilmer popped up. I couldn't believe it. He was looking good too. Looking um, good. That's, that's, that's <laughs> like one way to Shout out Val Kilmer. I do like the bloke. Ah, shit. Um, I, I actually, there's something about him I like. But I was looking at Nick Cage. My God, how many divorces this guy had? <laughs> Jesus Christ. How many he, castles in Germany does this guy have? He, he must be a weird unit in real life as well. But I tell you what, I, I recommend this film if you want to see Nick Cage unhinged for two hours doing the most fucking foul things. Um, it's it's a watch. Let's just say that. Seven out of ten. Um, How excited are you for another Werner Herzog film? I am excited. I want to. I, it, there was something about this that was very unique, especially what was with the fake iguanas can you yeah and, can you and like please the, tell the, me the about hand, that the handheld vcr footage oh that was just bizarre what's it all about well <laughs> if you wait and see this is just like david lynch where we're gonna go down the rabbit hole here okay all right future episode anyway so guys if you haven't seen the invitation or bad lieutenant um with nick cage check them out seriously they're they're both different watches but they're a Interesting films, nonetheless. What was your rating for The Invitation? My Invitation rating was an 8 out of 10. Oh, um, very high. Yeah, yeah. Really enjoyed it. Um, I, I understand your gripes with it, and I'd probably agree. But the fact that the screenplay was so out there, people don't talk like this, just made it even more eerie for me, even more crazy. And some of the scenes that you... I, I don't want to go into it too much, but... Some of the scenes are so bizarre and, and so unsettling that it creates a mood. And I thought the payoff was there, unlike Midsummer. But anyway, that's it for today's episode, Jackson. What have we got that's a, next that's a really, week? That's a really smooth transition there, Dan. I really enjoyed that segue. Thank you. What have we got next week? Well, Dan, since we both enjoyed each other's recommendations, how about we do this again for next week? Beautiful. Sounds good. What have you got for me this week? You ever seen Train Spotting? Train Spotting. I have, but it's been a while. All right, you're going you're going well into the depraved This is hold on. ruins of some heroin crack den in Scotland. Is this with Jason Statham? It certainly <laughs> isn't. 
listeners, that I, I haven't seen it. Hold on, I don't think we need, we need to mention the movie. We are off about. the rails today. Can I? I need to look this up. Jason Statham. There's a movie. Oh no, I've got it completely wrong. Transporter. Oh, Jackson, I'm so sorry. I've lost it. I've lost it today. I don't know what's going on. All right, I'm going to give you a few words for train spotting. Heroin, Scotland, Ewan McGregor, Underworld. <laughs> oh, that sounds brilliant. For me, nine out of ten. Sean Connery references. I can't wait to hear your take on train spotting. Damn, what do you recommend I watch for next week? What's been tickling your fancy? Jackson, I'm going to give you another one this week around the dinner party vibe. Oh, uh, okay. Not, not many people. I sense have, a theme. Not many people are seeing this one. Um, but I do recommend our listeners to go out and check this out. It's called Coherence. Coherence. Okay. It's it's a indie film, um, but very very unsettling as well. And I'm not going to go too much into it. Very similar to The Invitation in ways, though. So, uh, but very low budget. Don't expect um, much in terms well, of budget or actors. Was, what like a million? So I'm expecting this is even similar. this is ten thousand. This is low. Wow. So, but it pulls it off somehow, man. And I, I, I want you to watch it. We'll discuss it next week. Uh, coherence. So check it out. And I will check out Transporting. Transporter. Jason Stay. <laughs> but anyway. Such a laugh editing this episode. You're going to have to oh, use both. Whoever's both editing this is in for a ride. Shout out to our producers at Dan Allen Gaming. He's going to have a blast. Anyway, guys, thanks for tuning in to today's whirlwind of an episode. It's been a pleasure. Jackson, what have we got next week? Next week, Dan, we are watching something that has just dropped on streaming by the time you'll be listening to this episode, and that's the new Josh Trank feature of Chronicle and Fantastic Four fame, starring Tom Hardy, Capone. Ooh, here we go, Jack. When does it drop? When are we going to get our hands uh, on this? Well... If our producer has this episode out on time, it'll be released the very same day, May 12th. Let's Ooh, get stuck into Capone. Here we go. I'm looking forward to it in a way, I guess. No, Not high hopes. Definitely not high hopes. But Tom Hardy, one of my favorite actors, can he pull it off? We'll find Look, out. I'm excited for him to grunt his way through this. <laughs> anyway, guys, thanks for tuning in. As always, follow us on all social media platforms. In particular, I want you to follow us on Twitter if you've got one this week. Give us a follow. But guys, it's been an absolute pleasure to talk to you today. Jackson, any final words? Absolutely. You can find our Twitter at... under. <laughs> Absolutely. It's been a blast. You can find our Twitter <laughs> oh, no, at we you, underscore Can you what say it's been a blast? This. Can you say it's been a blast and try and sound believable? Well, listeners... Not like a robot. This is what I heard. Ready? Dan... It's been a blast. That's what I heard. Come on. Enthusiasm. Here we go. It's been a blast, Jackson. Listeners, thank you so much for tuning in this week. It's been an absolute blast. We certainly haven't lost our marbles, just like the elite in the hunt at this point, as well as following us on Twitter at we underscore watched underscore this. You can find us on Instagram Facebook and Letterboxd at We Watch This Podcast. Be sure to hit subscribe on whatever platform you're listening to us. And check out our sponsors, ExpressVPN for when you need to go undercover. ExpressVPN.com slash We Watch This, as well as Display for that next loved one's gift. Display.com slash We Watched This. You can find him at Dan Allen Movies, me at Marshall on Film, followed by an underscore. Thank you all so much. We will see you next week. Peace. Thanks for listening.